Stay tuned for Peace Paradigm Radio. Building a path for the peace paradigm. King and Gandhi, many more, have discovered something core. Now we're building a path for the peace paradigm. Every challenge is another highway sign. Welcome, everybody, to Peace Paradigm Radio, a project of the Meta Center for Nonviolence with the support of KWMR Community Radio. I'm Stephanie Van Hook, Executive Director of the Meta Center. Peace Paradigm Radio explores the power of active nonviolence. Nonviolence is not passivity or inaction, it's what Gandhi called the greatest power at the disposal of humankind and what Dr. King called love and action. Through conversations with people who are practicing the principles of nonviolence, we weave a complex and more complete vision of humanity's potential for good, despite the negative, negative messages from the corporate mass media. And from this ongoing, deep exploration of nonviolence emerges, week by week, a vindication of our shared human dignity, the basis upon which we are empowered to practice living our highest values and to build the beloved community. My co-host is Michael Nagler, and he's here with me today. Now, we have a great show for you. We have non, we have a longer segment today of nonviolence in the news, but that's because there's a lot going on, and um, there might be something special that happens during this news broadcast. You'll find out. And then in the second part of the show, we're introducing a new segment called Yeah, But. And Yeah, But, it, this is a segment that is sort of um, a therapeutic session for Michael and myself in one way, but it's also to challenge some of, to help answer and respond to some ch- some pretty common challenges of nonviolence. So we hope that you'll enjoy that segment as well and that you'll stay with us for the show of Peace Paradigm Radio. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Ludwig von Beethoven, for that lovely theme. I would like to read a paragraph uh, from the Bhagavad Gita for Daily Living by Eknath Ishwaran. This is volume one of a three-volume series, and volume one is called uh, The End of Sorrow. We like to do this because we feel that we all need inspiration in this path. And Ishran will be quoting from Swami Ramdas, a beloved Swami whose ashram uh, we visited a little while ago. Here it goes. We must learn to be vigilant constantly. We cannot lapse into lack of watchfulness for one minute. Swami Ramdas describes the joy of rising to this challenge. Quote, there is no greater victory in the life of a human being than victory over the mind. He or she who has controlled the gusts of passion that arise within him or her and the violent actions that proceed therefrom is a real hero. All the disturbances in the physical plane are due to chaos and confusion in the mind. Therefore, to conquer the mind through the awareness of the great truth that pervades all existence is the key to real success and the consequent harmony and peace in the individual and in the world. 
The true soldier is he or she who fights not the external, but the internal foes. Thank you, Michael Nagler, for that beautiful reflection from Eknath Ishwar. And coming up next is Nonviolence in the News on our show. Hold on. Hello again, everyone. This is Michael Nagler with Nonviolence in the News, a feature of Peace Paradigm Radio, where we do reports and analysis of the most important and most hopeful developments in our world, developments rarely cited and when cited often misunderstood by the commercial media. I'd like to remind you that Gandhi said about the radio, quote, it is a wondrous thing. In it, I see Shakti, the miraculous power of God. Now, if I haven't mentioned it before, there's a wonderful online source for Gandhi quotes and information, which is mkgandhi.org, and also the portal that's called Gandhi Heritage Portal is fully searchable now and a very, a very, very useful source of information. I might just toss in here that there was a week of book selling in Mumbai, formerly Bombay, India to celebrate the 66th anniversary of Gandhi's passing, which of course is celebrated as the onset of the uh, season for nonviolence. And in that short period of time, no less than 13,800 books on Gandhi, Vinoba, Bhave, or Sarvodaya were sold. My last resource to share with you this uh, show is a film called One Man's Quest, which is a film about Arabs who saved Jews during the Holocaust. Now for nonviolence in the news proper, as usual, I'd like to start off in these United States and then take a look at what's happening in the rest of the world. Wait, hey, what's going on hey, here? Hey, what? hey, what's happening? I think, is that, uh, what is this music? Uh, I'm supposed to be, uh, I think I'm being flash mobbed. What? Rhonda, are you there? I'm here. This is a flash mob in our radio station happening right now. In, in February and March, men and women around the world will, part- will participate in V-Day and One Billion Rising. V-Day is a global activist movement to end violence against women and girls, a catalyst that promotes creative events to increase awareness, raise money, and revitalize the spirit of existing anti-violence organizations. V-Day generates broader attention for the fight to stop violence against women and girls, including rape, battery, incest, female genital mutilation, FGM, and sex slavery. 
One Billion Rising is a movement on Valentine's Day to raise to rise up to protest the injustices and violence and abuse toward women and girls. And we are joined in this flash mob by Rhonda Black, Petaluma's One Billion Rising organizer. Welcome to Peace Paradigm Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit more about this movement? Um, what's the difference between V-Day and uh, One Billion Rising? For example, why do they call it One Billion Rising? Um, well, One Billion Rising is a global mu- movement. It's worldwide, and it is. Um, there are six billion people in the world. About half, or half of them, are women. One third of them will be raped or molested in their lifetime. And as they say, one billion women raped and molested is an atrocity, and one billion women rising is a movement, a movement to end violence. And how did you, Rhonda, get started with the local V-Day One Billion Rising um, movement? (laughs) I started by performing in my first vagina monologue about seven years ago where I said the C word on stage to a whole bunch of people. And we're actually not allowed to say that word on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> so so you said that you said that word on on and um and what else did you happen to do in that show? Um well the second year that I did it I performed 19 orgasms on stage. Oh my god. 19 of them on stage, I think three shows. And I've been volunteering and doing what I can and helping in violence against women and girls since then. Well, women and children, rather. All of this seems like it takes a lot of energy, Rhonda. Can you um, talk more about um, how long you've been an organizer and what this movement means to you? Well, I've started more in the last two years helping organize, but um, the seven years that I have been off and on helping or performing in the vagina monologue, it has created a lot in my life. And this last year, last year and this year, I've put a lot more energy into it, Um, going into schools and trying to recruit younger women and get the word out to younger people to bring to the forefront that violence is out there and they don't have to keep it all to themselves. There's people who will listen and people they can share it with and feel safe with. And you, you, and the way that V-Day in One Billion Rising is described, it's a movement for women and girls, but you take, you have a different take on that. You say women and children. Can you explain why? Well, because it's not just, Girls, I mean, well, it's not just um, women either, but it's not just girls. It's women and children. Boys are being humanly, human trafficking is happening to boys as well as girls. It's not as much, not as often, but it's happening. And do raped and molested as well. It's not just girls. That's a really, that's a good point, And I think that it's important to bring that out. Um, and you now do men participate in the One Billion Rising events? And um, do you find do that there's a lot of participation? Participate. Mm-hmm. We do. Um, and it seems like each year more and more men are becoming familiar with the vagina monologues and the One Billion Rising movement. And they're walking away from the stigma that it's male bashing. The vagina monologue is not male bashing. And we have men who support us. And it's really a beautiful thing to feel comfortable with the guys there supporting the women, supporting ending violence against women and girls. And, okay, have you always felt comfortable using the V word publicly? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It was a little much for the C word, but, you know, the V word's okay. (laughs) So... A little bit more about the local movement. Um, What organizations are you working with? Um, Right now I'm working with Guided to Safety, and Guided to Safety is hosting the One Billion Rising event here in Petaluma. Right, and Um, that's that's Trisha Allman? Trisha Allman is the president of it, and Renee McKenna is the vice president. Right, and they're great. So, and they have a website as well? 
I do. It's uh, guidedtosafety.org, I believe. Guidedtosafety.org. Okay. Yes. And um, I do have their, their mission is to provide resources and education for the awareness and prevention of domestic violence, teen dating violence, and sexual assault. And so with all of this, you know, the work with Guided to Safety and V-Day and One Billion Rising, um, for you personally, what's your short-term vision? Like, why are you getting involved in this? What, what's your short-term vision for it? And then what's your long-term vision? I want, want, I want to reach out to one more person and let them know they don't have to live in fear. Just one more. I just wanted to let you know that we have um, Katie in the studio putting up a piece of paper while I'm talking to you saying, it's okay to say vagina in the studio. So I'd, <laughs> vagina. <laughs> I'll invite my co-host to say it. You want me to say vagina? <laughs> <Okay>. You said it. <laughs> and so those listening might also just, you know, practice saying that word too. Why is it important to say that word? Vagina? Mm-hmm. Yeah, why is it important <laughs> Why is it important to say vagina? Why is it important to overcome? Um, there's, there's a lot of people who who can't say it. My aunt, who was 86 years old, never said it in her life. Although I think 10 of us around a table, 10 females around the table tried to convince her to say it, but she couldn't. <laughs> and she wouldn't. So I don't know. So... You have such a beautiful laugh, and I'm so happy to have you um, in, in this flash mob. Now, can you tell me about um, what is you know what's the significance of the flash mob? I played that music. Will people hear this around their town, around Petaluma? Will they hear that music in the other places? Flash mobs have actually been going around, going on the last two years, and we've been performing it around Petaluma the last few weeks, as well as last year we season. Um, and it's about breaking the chain of violence. Uh, you. You are, for instance, you're a parent. You inflict violence on your child. Your child grows up and inflicts abuse or violence on somebody else. And it's about taking a stand and breaking that chain and not inflicting it, not causing harm to another human being. In, in and that. and literally, people are going to. They'll hear that song on the street corner and they'll see people dancing to that music. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what a flash we we show up, we, we pick a couple of locations. We have a website if somebody is interested in, in finding out about where to take lessons, some free lessons and where we're gonna be flash mobbing. And you can join either the Facebook web page um let's see, where's that the Facebook web page is uh, one billion rising colon North Bay backslash Petaluma rises, and there's free lessons and scheduled flash mobs around town. Excellent. And any other events that you'd like to let people know about in Petaluma before Definitely. we wrap up? Mm -hmm. Valentine's Day is one billion rising, and we're going to rise up and dance together with the world. Everybody else rising up on the yeah. That's it's it's a really powerful. Else who is rising up on that same day across the world will be dancing and and our energies will be shared and enjoy and protesting the violence that's happening. Absolutely. I was at the event last year and I remember it felt very powerful to see, you know, people dancing all over the world. So as your time zone's over, you know, you go into another time zone and see other women and people, you know, coming together and help holding up the same message. And it's really, really powerful. So, Rhonda, thank you so much for taking time to, to flash mob our radio show today. <laughs> thank you. It was my pleasure. And my have pleasure, a really have a great day. You too. Enjoy. Enjoy. So, Michael, we're back with you on your, your news program. If you'd like to continue with um, nonviolence in the news, it's not going to be exciting as exciting as the V word, but you can not. go ahead. <coughs> For me, the V the V word has always been violence, but. Ah. Anyway, uh, this is the first time I've been on the receiving end of nonviolent disruption. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I know what it is that we're dishing out all the time, and it's, it's very interesting. So in getting back to our reports, I want to, again, I want to mention uh, Micah and Paige Monar, uh, interns who have helped me prepare this week's report. 
So in the United States, there has been a State Department environmental report recently on the uh, dangers of fracking and the Keystone XL pipeline. That report stated that there was not serious danger to the environment by um, these methods. <clears throat> and in only 72 hours after the release of that report, no less than 10,000 people were on the march in cities and towns across the country, organizing an astounding 283 vigils in 49 states to protest, nonetheless, this pipeline. Now, upcoming on Tuesday the 11th is being called The Day We Fight Back, and that means The Day We Fight Back Against Mass Surveillance. And they need help to make it as uh, strong and impactful as it can be. There are nearly 5,000 websites already that post w the day we fight back on their the banner of the day we fight back on their site. Looking a little further down the road, still in the U.S., on March 1st, hundreds of climate patriots will set out from Los Angeles, California, walking 3,000 miles across America to Washington D.C. It, to inspire people to act to resolve the climate crisis. This will be one of the largest coast-to-coast -coast marches in American history. And from their website, I call this statement, marchers will be expected to adhere to a strict code of nonviolence according to the principles employed by Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi. They will have addenda that explain this in greater detail, and they will provide mandatory nonviolence training at the start of the march. I was very glad to see this because uh, this is how we can maintain the nonviolent character of our public demonstrations. What I personally will be looking for is follow-ups because, um, you know, protest and marches and demonstrations are very good ways to start focusing attention on a movement, but they're not very good places to stop. Where do we go from there? What real concrete changes will be introduced, hopefully still in that nonviolent character? Well, in this connection, I'd like to mention that uh, Mark Jacobson, who's a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, and for me, an old Berkeley man to be citing a Stanford colleague is already somewhat nonviolent. He and his teammates have been showing that it's feasible for the whole world to get all of its energy from wind, water, solar, and geothermal by 2050, and 80% of it on the way there by 2030. At this point in time, <clears throat> now this is my own recent observation from another source, Germany is getting 25% of its energy right now from renewable sources, and Chancellor Merkel wants to expand that to 80% uh, in the next five years. So we can now uh, make our segue to the wider world. Um, unfortunately, I start off with a very sad announcement about uh, the city of Fallujah, which is under such a drastic siege. I'm only citing it for two reasons. One, to point out what a superb example this is of the futility of war, we mounted, the United States military mounted a horrific attack on Fallujah during our occupation, which ended two years ago. It was been, it's been considered practically a genocide because the young men in the city were not allowed to leave, and then the city was uh, almost demolished. And so we could not have been more violent. And if violence works, then it should have kept some kind of graveyard peace in Fallujah, but instead we have another uprising on our hands there. And the second thing I want to point out is that this violence, the recent violence began when the Iraqi Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, forced a nonviolent protest camp in Fallujah to disperse. That's a camp that had been active for a year, and uh, we were slightly in touch with some of the nonviolent activists in Iraq generally, and it was the one chance of resolving that dispute without bloodshed. And so to shut it down means that you had only one option left, which is the option of violence. Exactly the wrong way to go about it. Well, uh, <clears throat> moving on to an, another operation, which has been using a certain amount of humor, 
And uh, that's kind of a theme that I've noticed in uh, this week's nonviolent news. It's called Operation Salami. It's a takeoff on Operation Salt, and it's modeled on the Salt campaign. That was the turning point of the freedom struggle for India in 1930. What happened was a number of people wanted transparency. They wanted the release of certain files that uh, they, de they wanted them declassified. They felt they belonged to the public. So very calmly and politely, they walked two by two, just like the uh, SALT campaign climax at Darsana Salt Pans with groups of 25 following one another. Fortunately, there was no physical violence here. They were not beaten down. And they failed, if you want to call it that, to get those documents released right then and there. However, they gained popular support, and a few weeks later, the government had to release the files. Not only that, but under a barrage of attacks uh, that were started by the now public texts, the uh, whole trade agreement that those you know, files were related to, it was the secrecy of the trade agreement that they were they were protesters were after. That trade agreement was scuttled. So you have a good example. Here's where I put my analytical hat on. Have a good example of what we call work versus work. Work means get work in quotes means to get something done that you want done right away. And nonviolence sometimes succeeds in doing that, just as violence sometimes succeeds in doing that. But the difference is that nonviolence always does good work, does work without quote marks, and nonviolence always does bad work. Now, another element in this campaign I'd like to cite wait, is wait, that— Wait, wait, Did you just say that nonviolence always does bad work? I'm sorry. If <laughs> I did, it was using that V word that got me all confused. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Nonviolence will always have a good effect on the system and do good work down the road. I'll be happy to share other examples. This is Peace Paradigm Radio, not Violent Paradigm Radio, Michael. And it's going to stay that way if I can keep myself from getting too confused. I just want to mention quickly that uh, one of the things that got this success was the promise of the protesters to keep on escalating. Notice that a promise to escalate is not what we call threat power, but you do have to do this in nonviolence. You have to say, if you won't do this, we will be forced to do that. And that's what uh, caused the board to release 98% of, of the documents that were requested. Well, if I have room for one more uh, episode, I'd like to turn to our almost uh, steady reports of uh, what's going on in South Korea, Jeju Island. Uh, where the village of Gangjong, which has been chosen for the construction of a joint naval base by the U.S. and South Korea. For seven years now, the villagers and internationals who have joined them, some of them uh, connected with us at the Meta Center, have been trying to block that construction. Well, three, three things are new now. There is a film called The Ghosts of Jeju, which um, is very, very powerful. In fact, it's kind of heavy, and you want to watch it with some care. But it should be available soon. And uh, actually, Oliver Stone uh, is producing it. The second thing is that, believe it or not, he may not be aware of this yet, but Pope Francis is being invited to visit the island and the village. He is going to visit South Korea shortly, and there's a letter-writing campaign to urge him to visit the fellow Catholics and the Jesuits and the other activists on that island. Last thing, there is an activist who started this letter-writing campaign um, and who is in the, uh, the documentary The Ghosts of Jeju, who will be coming shortly to the United States. His name is Joyak Golzo. And he needs to raise $2,000 to pay the expenses for his trip and the lecture tour so that he can get the word out about the struggle on Jeju Island. This is a time-honored technique of people come over to the U.S. and elsewhere and, and go around and give lectures. If you were inclined to support uh, his trip, you can send a message to Micah's address at gmail.com. That's M-I-C-A-S. A D D R E S S at gmail.com. 
That wraps up, but does not complete the roster of nonviolence in the news this week. Thank you very much. You're listening to KWMR 90.5 Point Race Station, 89.9 Bolinas, and streaming live at kwmr.org. If my words did glow With the gold of sunshine And my tunes were played On the hall of strung Would you hear my voice Come through the music Would you hold it near As it were your own it's a hand-me-down The thoughts are broken Perhaps they're better Left unsung I don't know Don't really care Let there be song to fill the air Ripple in still water When there is no pebble toss No wind to blow Reach out your hand If you cut the air Welcome back, everybody, to Peace Paradigm Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook, and we're starting a new segment today, and I'm calling it the Yeah, But segment, so everyone can practice saying that Yeah, But. And this comes from, basically, whenever we have a conversation about nonviolence, after you start learning even a little bit about it, you want to tell a lot of people about it or try to um, you automatically start getting into um, some challenging discussions. And generally, the, the response that you get from somebody is, that sounds nice, but, yeah, but. And what we find is that what comes, bef- what comes before those, that yeah, but, are certain misconceptions held about nonviolence. So we thought we'd start working on some crowdsourced questions um, about nonviolence. And we have with us in the studio, Katie, who's going to play the devil's advocate. So Katie, welcome to Peace Paradigm Radio. Hi, thanks for having me. And you are going to uh, ask us some questions, and I'm going to turn up Michael's mic, and we're going to just talk them out with you. So feel free, feel natural. (laughs) (laughs) Can do, can do. All right, first one on the list here. Um, Tell me, I, I thought that human beings were innately aggressive to begin with. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, you thought wrongly there, Katie. <laughs> uh, human beings have the capacity for aggression, but they are also having a capacity for cooperation. In fact, recently evolutionary biologists have been saying we are super cooperators. And we would be at the level of the lemurs today if we had not evolved cooperation. And there's a marvelous uh, book, if you have uh, a couple of weeks to read a 750 page book edited by my colleague Douglas Fry, and it's called War, Peace, and Human Nature. And I think that it is no matter where you look in science, you can look to remotest um, ancient world where we have no historical record. You can look at you know how many skeletons have been apparently the result of violent deaths, all the way up to modern psychology and especially the discovery of mirror neurons in in neuroscience, and what you see is, yeah, despite the enormous capacity of human beings for violence, there's an even more capacity, an even more enormous capacity for nonviolence. And, you know, as the old story is, it's just which wolf do we want to feed? Tell us, what is that story? Thought you'd never ask, Stephanie. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 
<laughs> the story is about a Native American uh, who tells his grandson, I feel like I have two wolves inside of me. One, one of them is a vicious, snarling beast, and the other is a calm, peaceful animal, and they are, you know, they are at one another. And the grandson says, well, for heaven's sake, Grandpa, which one is going to win? And he says, the one that I feed. If you sit in front of violent television programming or films or books or whatever, you'll be feeding the violent wolf, and you will be capable of a lot of violence. If you do the opposite, you'll be capable of heroic, compassionate, courageous nonviolence. Yeah, but, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is something that, let's, you know, let's, pull, let's draw this out a little bit more because when Katie asks you this question and you give her a series of, you know, read this book and think about that, that might not convince, you know, Uncle Tom at at, at um, Christmas dinner who's, you know, a um, very military, pro-military, very pro-violence. Mm. So what am I going to tell my uncle? <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know I'm not, besides, besides... Uh, not using what is, is there a way to go you know to present the reason on one hand but then what else can what other information could i present mm. that tries to reinforce that human beings aren't innately aggressive i guess there's two things uh not knowing your uncle tom that i would use and incidentally these are wonderful questions but in in future shows we're actually going to open up the line for you in the radio audience to pose these questions but uh, I guess there are two things you could point out to him. You could ask him to introspect, look inside of himself. He has both these impulses going on in him if he's a normal human being. And which one does he feel more comfortable with? Uh, which one, if he really, don't, don't ask him to answer you because there might be pride issues involved. But if in a moment of quiet introspection you look inside yourself and you see you have a capacity to lash out, but you also have a capacity to reach out in compassion. You even have a capacity to sacrifice yourself for the well-being of others. And which of those in your quiet, most honest, most introspective moments, which, ones, which one do you really resonate with? Which one do you feel is more yourself? And I have, I have every confidence that, that people will find in themselves these capacities which have been covered over by mass media propaganda, but they're in there. And I have actually used this technique in, in communicating with people, and, and it does work. Mm, Katie, are you convinced? Maybe, maybe not. I've got another question, which is that I've, you know, I've heard of nonviolence before, and I know what nonviolence means. It just means being nice to everyone. Stephanie, do you want to smash or, I mean, answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of how to tie it into the first question, too. Um, I, I don't know if I'm the right one to answer this, but um, I find that nonviolence, it's actually not about being nice to everyone. Um, that's sort of a... Uh, it's it's a tough way of looking at, at the topic where we can actually get more information when we think about it in other ways. So um, sometimes being nice to someone is disagreeing with them when they're when they're harming themselves or others. And so that doesn't look like the kind of it doesn't look like always being mm, polite. So I, I remember a friend saying to me before that um, some of the worst situations that he's ever been in have been situations where he was just trying to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> that there's a lot of violence that can um, happen when we're just trying to be polite. So this isn't a case against being polite to people when we are resisting them, and, but we can resist people lovingly and nonviolently without tearing them down as human beings, but saying, I want to try to hold up your humanity. So niceness doesn't, what I'm trying to get at is that niceness doesn't always look like what we think niceness means. Yeah, I would add to that, Stephanie, uh, that your recent article on cooperation and non-cooperation that'll be appearing in tra Transformation mm -hmm. of Democracy Now? Open, Open, no, demo yeah. <laughs> Open, <laughs> Open Democracy. Democracy. Oh, well, yeah. wish fulfillment here. <laughs> uh, it speaks very well to this, that what we're really uh, arguing for and recommending in people is that not that they enable their politeness all the time or their 
resistance all the time, but that they enable their discrimination. And that means you're going to resist things that are harmful and support things that are helpful. But it also means something much more important, Stephanie, that you just pointed to, which is you're never going to be against the well-being of the person. You are going to offer nonviolent resistance to them, and there are incredibly courageous examples of people doing this throughout the world, for their benefit, because you believe that that's not who they are. For example, if I were to uh, be, let's say, in a discussion with someone who's preparing to recruit himself into the military, I would point out that an enormous number of our combat veterans, even those who just push buttons in the drone control centers, have been committing suicide. And that's because their innate humanity is revolted by what they're being called upon to do. So in order to help that person and in order to bring out his or her innate humanity, I might do everything that I could to resist the step that they're about to undertake. Mm -hmm. And another way I think about it, too, is mm, a, in nonviolence, we call it integrative power, which is essentially the power of authenticity, of being who you are. And a lot, when you're not being who you are, you can try to not hurt people's feelings and be really nice because we can imagine that um, from any, 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 in any topic that if you, you don't want to upset other people, and so that's actually not being nonviolent. That's being passive. The, the challenge is to how to mm, confront or challenge um, misheld um, or misconceptions about, um, you know, a specific struggle or a specific identity or whatever it, it might be that you're challenging um, without, again, without lowering the human, the, the human being in front of you. Mm -hmm. So... But how do you do that? Yeah, but what do you do with uh, when when you're up against a person or a group of people who are really really nasty and and mean and you, I mean and all you want to do is yell and scream at them. What do you do then? So uh, that's a good question. Um, now uh, uh, tying this into being nice. Uh, sort of it's like the principle that uh, they're not being very nice so we can see them in a way as going suffering either suffering from what's happening you know wh whatever they're angry about we can see that as a form of suffering but we can also see the suffering in terms of um, an ignorance especially if it's in terms of a social issue that really does need to change um, that they're standing against and so there's a deep suffering there's an alienation there the suffering of alienation and so, you know, what, what's nice in that situation is not to um, make those people more angry and suffer more. Um, but what we want to help do is to end the suffering of these people so that they can feel less alienated and then, you know, come together with us and help to heal the social barriers that have created alienation in the first place, where they're projecting alienation onto another group or myself or to others, whoever. Yeah. So... Um, so it takes a lot of training, actually, and a lot of practice to transform whatever those initial responses that we definitely have to respond in kind with angry words, um, thoughts, deeds, um, to something more positive and healing. And that, that's, gonna, that's not going to necessarily um, be our first conditioned response, but it's definitely something that we're capable of. So true. And I, I'm thinking of uh, something Martin Luther King said in this connection, where he said, I'm not going to let any man bring me down so low as to make me hate him. In other words, in situations I've been in where people have been yelling in, at me and dissing me, sometimes for good reason, <laughs> my first thought is, if I start yelling back at them, then we're, then we're both drowning. But if I can maintain some kind of calm composure then by the phenomenon of mirror neurons, my different mood will actually tend to elicit a better mood in that other person. And people have often seen this happen in almost miraculous ways where you go up to somebody. Well, I remember uh, my good friend Mel Duncan, who was one of the co-founders of Nonviolent Peace Force, 
passed a scene in St. Paul one day where a, a guy had gone berserk, and he was beating up and on another person viciously. And Mel ran down and, and kind of got in front of this uh, person, the beater, and, and looked at him and said, my goodness, you're a real leader, aren't you? And within a couple of minutes, he had talked this guy out of that berserk mood. The key being that people, as you say, Stephanie, people who are being angry are hurting. And they're hurting in their own self-respect. So the most effective thing you can do is, it may not feel natural, but you feed them with a little bit of self, a little bit of respect. And you are not going to be patronizing, but at the same time, you are absolutely not going to be pushed out of shape by their anger. One, one point that I've found is really helpful in this regard for me whenever I think about this question is um, the reminder that of what strength is and that um, in this situation, you're going to have to be the stronger person. And the stronger person means the one who can see the situation for what it is and, um, and, what, and then act from that place of knowing. Can I tell my favorite Zen story now? There's a story about a, a monastery that's being attacked, and the head of the person who's attacking comes up to the abbot of the monastery who's sitting there quietly in meditation. He raises his samurai sword, and the abbot doesn't even flinch, and so the brigand says to him, don't you know who I am? I could cut you to ribbons without blinking an eye. And the abbot calmly says, and don't you know who I am? I could let you cut me to ribbons without blinking an eye. Which leads us to another misconception about nonviolence. Yes, right. Unfortunately, or, sorry. <laughs> if we want to, if we want to go there, um, but I want to return back to Katie to see if um, if she's satisfied with any of these responses or if you still have yeah buts. I got a couple more yeah buts uh-huh. um, with that Zen story there. You know, a lot of this nonviolence talk sounds kind of spiritual to me. You know, like it has kind of religious meanings or leanings, but I'm not religious, so I'm not required to be nonviolent, right? No, you're not. No, you're not required (laughs) to be nonviolent. We don't even, Katie, we don't even like to look at this as a moral issue, but rather as a completely pragmatic issue. So it's just a question of what will be the outcome if I'm violent versus what will be the outcome if I'm nonviolent? And we also like to add to this, because, you know, recently on, on Nonviolence in the News, I was just talking about Fallujah, and such enormous violence was unleashed on that city, and it, it solved nothing. You have to go and do it all over again. But I want to add one quick thing to that before I turn it over to Stephanie, and that is that in f- using this rule of thumb, what will be the outcome, it's also quite important to look, as we were saying earlier, at the internal outcome. You know, if you are going to be angry at somebody, you are going to be suffering one thousandth of a heart attack. There's something inside you that will not be proud of yourself for having given rein to that anger. So uh, it's not only what result is this going to have on the situation, but re- what result will it have on me? And it's important to keep those both dimensions. They're both very real. We're keeping them both in mind. There's a lot I want to say to this one. <laughs> Um, let's see. The first area I'd like to look at is this um, quote from Gandhi who says that nonviolence is the law of the humans. He's not saying that this is the law of the Jains or the, <laughs> law, or the law of um, Muslims or the law of Christians, um, but human beings. And so that what we're trying to unpack at Meta Center in our work in particular is, you know, what's human about this power of nonviolence, um, n- not, not what's religious about it. And the other, the, going on that, the, one of the misconceptions that I do hear in that question, that, which is often posed to us about um, religion and nonviolence, is that um, when we look at the history of religion, we actually don't see necessarily like religions necessarily being places of um, nonviolence all the time. So we have, you know, crusades and jihads and, you know, and so forth. There are people in hypocrisy, right? We, we see this in religions, even though, you know, in mysticism, what you're trying to do is really get to the heart of religion, see nonviolence at the core of it. Nonetheless, when we look at the history, we see that there's a lot of violence in religions. And so 
I feel like what this question sometimes does is suggest um, implicitly that people with, who are atheist are somehow violent or who are more prone to use violence because they're atheists. And I think that um, that's, um, that's a misconception that I'd, I'd like to explore more um, in more depth because I don't, I don't think that um, – I think that that could be a, almost a dehumanizing way of describing people that don't necessarily describe to religious beliefs or values. And I, I think Gene Sharp says it. I, I like a lot. He said um, he's a renowned nonviolence theorist, uh, political scientist, and he says the I don't worry so much about what people believe. I worry about what people do. In that connection, Stephanie, is an example of this, which is always come to mind for me in the early days of the nonviolent intervention movement. I guess we're still kind of early in that movement. There were about 20 organizations that were training people and sending them out into global hotspots to intervene in conflicts, to be a useful third party, offer good offices, and if necessary, do what we uh, came to call interposition, is actually get in between combating elements. And uh, the interesting thing about these organizations was about half of them were explicitly religious. And the other half ranged from not having a commitment to being explicitly not secular, not having any religious affiliation. And yet, in line with what Gene Sharp said that you just quoted, they're both doing exactly the same thing. They are risking their life for the well-being of strangers. And as far as I'm concerned, that's their religion. Had or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> and it, that's their, let's say, that's their spirituality. That's, that's their vision. It did not come from a religious commitment. I, I think real nonviolence cannot come from any kind of external affiliation like that. It has to come from your own awareness of what another human being is and how you're connected with them. I'm reminded of um, a, a, somebody approached Maya Angelou and said, you know, I'm a Christian. And she looked at them and she said, already? <laughs> I was in a taxi cab in New York once with Charlie Mingus, and there was a young lady who said to him, I'm a Buddhist. And he said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> who is Charlie Mingus? Just well, he was a jazz, a jazz bassist who I liked very much. And actually, it was a Buddhist monk in the cab who said that. So I'd like to add a yeah, but to this okay. conversation now. Um, yeah, but also spiritual practice can help nonviolence. Let's look at the other side to mm -hmm. that. Because it can give you a deep and powerful awareness of your connection with others. Not only that, I think it gives you, or I have experienced, that it gives me more of an awareness of what's going on in my own mind. So before I had a spiritual practice, I used to respond to my own anger with a certain amount of thrill. And now I feel it's dragging me down, man. I don't want to go down there. They have a kind of revulsion. Gets it. And I think that's an awareness that one can gain through spiritual disciplines. Yeah, but we're not telling you to just believe us. We're suggesting that people try it out in their own lives. Yeah, but that's absolutely right. <laughs> Katie, last words? <laughs> yeah, but I <laughs> guess that sounds good to me. <laughs> Yay, yeah. we, we, uh, we won another convert to nonviolence. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for Peace Paradigm Radio. Until the next time, take care of one another. Bye-bye.